Right. So, yes, um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, the goal of today's talk is to basically give a, a very brief initial description of what kind of Valhalla system uh, there may be in Ihanzu. Um, and the analysis that I'm going to present involves both impressionistic judgments as well as um, some empirical measurements. Um, but first of all, to kind of situate the the talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, especially for those of us that are not necessarily familiar with the typology of Bantu. Um, so not, both, most uh, Bantu languages have either a five or a seven vowel system. So uh, it will be typically one of these if you're a five vowel language or one of these uh, if you're a seven vowel language. And uh, Valhami of one sort or another is extremely widespread within the family at large. Um, and in five vowel languages, this typically manifests itself as the lowering of high vowels to mid after mid vowels. So this is what we get in, for example, Bemba or Swahili. Um, and then in the seven vowel languages, we have a similar system, um, but the alternations typically involve the second and third highest pairs of vowels, what we call degree two and three vowels, as opposed to uh, the involving the higher, the first first degree vowels, the highest of the vowels. And this is what we get, for example, in Rangi or Kikuyu. And I'll show you some examples of this in a second. Now, in addition to this very uh, this, this generalization, we also very commonly get some sort of asymmetry in the behavior of front and back vowels in the system. And uh, harmony typically fails to change, um, make any modifications to final verbal or derivational vowels. Um, and typical systems such as that in Swahili, Rangi, Kikuyu are uh, progressive, proceeding rightwards from the beginning of a root. So we get something like this in Swahili, where we have this applicative suffix, uh, e, which is realized as e after uh, e and o in uh, verb roots. Um, and uh, the reversive suffix is u, uh, and only lowers to o after o itself. And then in Rangi, um, we have, uh, as I say, a similar situation, um, just involving uh, it and e rather than, uh, so the only place you get lowering is of e, uh, of e to e after uh, e and o, these degree, uh, these degree three vowels. Um, and then we get similar asymmetry in that o is only lowered to o after o itself. And the situation is uh, very similar in Kikuyu, just that the vowel inventory is different. And so the degree two vowels are uh, e and o rather than e and o. And uh, there are also seven vowel languages uh, in Bantu which have vowel harmony that can be seen to act uh, regressively between, say, roots and stems and prefixes. So this could be the case with, say, noun class prefixes. And also some languages in which we get uh, harmony of uh, the low vowel. Um, and this, for example, might be progressive with, uh, say, the final inflectional vowel in verbs. And so I've got an example here from Koyo, where this noun class prefix e is realized as e before e and o. And then the final inflectional vowel a is lowered to e and o after e and o themselves. Now, when it comes to Ihanzu, um, it's been previously described as a seven vowel language, um, but to the best of my knowledge, there have been no firm or explicit statements uh, about uh, the, 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 the system of vowel harmony that may or may not exist in the language. So Andrew, in the introductory talk to um, our uh, course, speculated that there may be some sort of regressive vowel harmony that exists between, say, prefixes and roots. Um, and then in the uh, phonology and morphology sketch for Letsky and uh, Diami, uh, they don't explicitly mention vowel harmony, but some sort of progressive vowel harmony is implicit in the transcription, in the use of two different allomorphs, eek and ek, for the state of verbal extension. Um, but it does seem that not all verbal suffixes alternate. So uh, those verbal suffixes containing low vowels alternate, however. So the perfective I've seen invariably transcribed the first vowel as e. And the final verbal vowels a, a, sorry, a, a, e, um, which all have different grammatical functions, um, are also invariably transcribed as such. So this brings me then to the research questions of this particular project, which is, first of all, does uh, Ihanzu exhibit vowel harmony? If so, what vowels are triggers, which are targets? 
are there any front back asymmetries as we commonly see is about how many progressive or regressive and if both do they behave the same or different um and then in what uh prosodic or morphologic environments do we get that harmony and i should note here that for the second decision i'm going to be concentrating on only non-low vowels as potential targets um now a little bit about the methodology so the data come from roughly three hours three hours of elicitation with Nico across five sessions. Uh, I do give one or two examples from elsewhere, and these are marked with the following asterisk, just to make it clear that they're not from my data in particular. Um, and the focus of my elicitation sessions was, given the the, the typology of Bantu, uh, as we understand it, um, verbs, especially with verbal extensions and different suffixes. And these were listed both in isolation and in any sentences, so I got both, uh, I got a variety of prefixes as well as uh, nouns, uh, not just verbs. And uh, yes, I undertook uh, both impressionistic auditory and empirical acoustic analysis of vowel qualities. So utterances were were chunked and transcribed in the text grid. This was then fed into a sports aligner, which for which I had to compile custom resources for Ihanzu, because of course there's no out of the box compatibility for Ihanzu. Um, and I manually corrected each of the vowel tokens in my data. Then added an extra data to the text grid with morphological segmentation to the best of my understanding. So I got something like this out the other side, for example, for this uh, simple sentence. And uh, then using a Pratt script, extracted various measurements, um, of course, formant values being important, um, and all of the uh, subsequent analysis and visualization was done in R. And now a little bit about the vowel system. So based on the previous literature, it's uncontroversial to say that Ihanzu has seven phonemic vowel qualities, and these are written thus in the practical orthography. And these kind of basic characters, uh, there is agreement that these represent E, U, E, O, and A, but these barred characters, uh, for these barred characters, is not uh, seemingly the same consensus, or it's not necessarily as obvious. Um, so for example, Andrew, um, in, uh, for example, the talk, as I say, the same talk I mentioned before, transcribed it as e and u, um, as does Marcelo. Um, but in uh, the sketch, um, Beletsky and Diami uh, argue that e and u should be used instead. And this disagreement is really not surprising given um, previous observations that distinguishing these vowels is kind of fraught with difficulty, especially in the context of African languages with tongue root harmony of some kind or another. So then this plot here is the F1, F2 space of uh, all of the vowels collected in my data. And we can see that there is uh, a lot of overlap here between these uh, degree one and degree two vowels. But this is, like I say, aggregated across all the data, so dot lots of different contexts. So if we look at, uh, control the context and look at only say uh, initial vowels in verb roots, we see that there's much less overlap, but there's, there's still some overlap. And these uh, degree two vowels really are approaching on the degree one vowels. Um, and my impressionistic judgment is that uh, more often than not, so uh, the, the the front uh, vowel is realized as more tense mid-like than it is a uh, lax, uh, high lax-like. But uh, I think there are tokens where you could argue that so you could argue that perhaps both are found, or at least that was my impression. But somewhat unusually, um, I had the opposite impression for the back vowel, that it seemed to me that it was more, my my impressionistic judgment was that there was more tokens of oh like examples than oh like examples, so more lax than tense. Um, but both, again, I could, I came up with examples with with, with both but not contrastively, I should say. And so there's definitely further investigation required using different measures, potential statistical techniques, but this is not uh, the focus of this talk. And rather than commit to a given transcription, I'm gonna just use the orthography from here on out. And I should say then that the major, that F1 is the major coral here um, to distinguish the vowels, and I'm gonna be using this for the sake of simplicity throughout. So progressive harmony. So uh, in a nutshell, I found progressive harmony that is very similar to what we get in Rangi and Kikuyu. Um, so with, for example, derivational suffixes uh, like the applicative, the stative, and what for want of a better label I've here termed the intensive, um, we get um, this degree two vowel, front degree 
uh, from a uh, degree two vowel lowering to a degree three vowel. So something like I lowering to E. Uh, so we've got here uh, in the, the verb to, to build and to stack, we've got these two extensions, the uh, intensive and the applicative being lowered. And then in the back dimension, this was much more difficult to elicit since the, the, re the so-called re reversive suffix has been kind of, is highly lexicalized in a lot of cases. Um, but it does seem to be the case that there is some sort of restriction that O cannot occur after O and you only get O instead. So we have some examples here of, first of all, lack of alternation and then a potential example of what is a, a reversive suffix with the, the degree three about rather than degree two about. Um, but then not all verbal extensions alternate. So we have the example here. Of, um, so this is kind of a, a counterpart to what I called the intensive and I called this the attenuative or I don't want to that label. Um, and this is invariably, the vowel in this is invariably E, so a degree one vowel, this does not alternate. Similarly, the first vowel, the perfective suffix E does not alternate. Um, at least that, these, are, these are my impressionistic judgments, right? Um, and similarly for uh, the plural imperative, uh, the final vowel E does not seem to alternate. And this plot here then is showing the comparison of uh, sort of verb uh, vowels in verb roots versus these suffixes and then final vowels in particular. And there is basically the there is agreement more or less between uh, how I've coded these and then uh, the F1 measurements that I took for these. But then breaking open these categories and looking at potential effects of preceding vowel, there are perhaps some additional gradient effects. But, um, but yeah, there is overall support for these uh, proposed categorical alternations and no further categorical alternations. Um, with There is perhaps some raising of final E after E, and we've got a lot of data there because of this perfective suffix E there. Um, then uh, the eagle eyed among you might have spotted that in uh, this top middle pane here, we have some suffixes which seem to have e, so this blue box here, after a. And so these are in fact just tokens of kind of a, a, a vowel in the passive extension, which usually is just work, but because the verb here is just uh, a single consonant per, the kind of default vowel there, uh, e is inserted, and this is not being governed by the quality of the preceding vowel in the word because this is um, in the prefix and not in the in the verb root. And then regressive harmony. Um, so we might potentially find regressive harmony between, say, prefixes and following roots, between roots and following suffixes, uh, or roots and stems and uh, following suffixes, and then potentially within stems. Um, but I, in my examination of my data so far, have not found any strong evidence of patterns of this kind. But I should say that my data here was were far less targeted and coverage was poor, especially for, for C. Um, and so if I show you then examples here of noun and verb prefixes as compared to um, the uh, same verb qual uh, vowel qualities in, uh, in uh, root initial position. Um, then, well, first of all, I should say though that mid vowels are not generally found in prefixes, at least as far as I was able to glean from my data. And there was very few tokens that I coded them as having mid vowels I've omitted here because they were so few. Um, now, the results here show that perhaps there is some raising of this degree, the front degree two vowel in noun prefixes before high vowels in following roots. Um, and that what I've coded as being this degree two vowel in verbs is generally quite high. And I'm not too sure whether this is perhaps some effect of conditional raising, um, whether there is a uh, vowel reduction because um, in prefixes, vowels are very prone to being reduced in duration. Um, and this may, uh, and they're also less, less, less prominent prosodically typically. Um, and so this might then lead to uh, vowel reduction, which is kind of obscuring any potential um, lack of assimilation, so we say. Or it could also be that there are just transcription errors, and so I'm mixing categories which are not, um, I'm conflating categories, basically. So, um, or it could be a combination 
of these three. But at the moment, I don't see any strong evidence um, that there is true categorical vowel harmony, regressive vowel harmony going on here. Um, and then comparing, uh, so looking within stems and their suffixes then, there is here little structured variation, but there's one exception, which seems to be there is a uh, quite a substantial degree of raising in e here and o here um, when the following vowel is e. Um, and now this puts me in mind of something that you get in uh, so various southern Bantu languages such as Venda, uh, Zulu, Kosa, um, which is that the underlying lax mid vowels are tensed before e and u, so the high tense vowels. Um, so this is potential, potentially one instance of regressive harmony of a sort. Um, and then so this discussion portion will, sorry, I've got one part which is lots of caveats. So first of all, I want to say this is obviously certainly not the last word on vowel harmony in Hanzu. Um, and that though the recordings are uh, not exceedingly dirty, um, there is still some degree of background noise and various kind of tracking areas which might be kind of muddying the waters a little bit. Uh, so it's by no means you know, lab quality speech data. Um, and of course, these were all gathered from a single older male speaker. And there is always a possibility for variation um, of some kind. Um, and this may or may not be the case with younger speakers in particular. Um, so there may have been a generational shift. And this could perhaps have been induced by contact with other neighboring languages, which may have uh, different harmony systems. So I've seen uh, Andrew's pointing me towards evidence that there may be regressive harmony of some sort between prefixes and roots in, say, uh, Nilamba. And so perhaps contact here could be inducing change, but obviously this is pure speculation at this point. Um, and then obviously another thing to say then, caveats out of the way, is then thinking more in, in the broader perspective then is this is only acoustic data. And in fact, what I talked about here is mainly only F1, really. And so what's going on with articulation? So the role of the, the tongue root and pharyngeal expansion is, is particularly interesting in the system given uh, so the way in which uh, the lowering occurs, um, but also this potential front-back asymmetry, um, not only within the alternations, but also perhaps given my impressionistic judgment on the uh, realizations of the degree two vowels, regardless of harmony. Now, uh, whether or not this is through acoustics or articulation, more precisely determining the true nature of what these degree, degree two vowels actually are, is then going to be crucial to informing any formal analysis of this system. So for example, are we talking about agreement for a feature like plus or minus ATR or plus or minus high? Right? This depends on what the quality of the vowels in the system actually is and what's going on there. Um, and then if there is some sort of asymmetry that runs very deep, um, perhaps even deeper than is uh, canonical in Bantu languages, are, the, are we talking about one system or are we talking about two systems? When, um, looking at front versus back vowel harmony. And uh, one thing though that I, I think I can say for certain is that it does seem to be the case that only uh, uh, only uh, the degree two vowels and degree three vowels are involved in progressive alternations and that these alternations are only found within the verb stem as again is common throughout Bantu languages with progressive harmony. Um, but also some potential avenue for future uh, work is to look at what static generalizations we might be able to make across the lexicon um, that I've not been able to tap into uh, in any detail here. Okay, so that's uh, what I've got to say to you today. So what I'll sum up by saying what I found was that Hanzu exhibits a form of progressive vowel harmony, which is, is typical of seven vowel Bantu languages akin to something like Rangi or Kikuyu. Um, and in, in verbal extensions, whether or not they're lexicalized, because some of the extensions are kind of uh, weakly lexicalized or highly lexicalized, depending on um, the particular verb. Um, we get lowering of uh, e to e uh, after both e and o, but lowering of o to o only after o. And then suffixes containing the degree one vowel, the high vowel e, um, so such as this so-called attenuative and the perfective. Um, 
And then the final inflectional vowels do not show any category alternations. And then I found little to no convincing evidence of regressive harmony with this one potential exception at the moment, perhaps being this tensing of e and o before e. But notice that this doesn't create a new, this doesn't merge then with, a, with an existing category. Um, and so thank you very much for listening, Songi. And uh, most particularly thank you to all my, uh, so Nico, to, to my, uh, uh, my colleagues, and to uh, Andrew. And there are my references. Thank you. Stephen Songalan Nuewe, thank you very much um, for uh, this sort of uh, deep dive. I have to say that this is sort of a different uh, kind of talk from a lot of our Ihonzu um, uh, uh, symposia talks in the past, which have mainly focused on morphosyntax or lexical quality. So it's actually really refreshing to uh, see somebody taking this kind of approach to a field methods course, and then sort of actually employing all of these sort of really interesting techniques. Now, I know that this is something that you've been working on for your dissertation as well. So it's not entirely new or out of the blue for you. It's actually an extension of, of, um, of uh, some of your uh, current interests and work. Um, okay, so I think that you've, you've, you've laid out sort of several different desiderata for where we could go. What is the number one priority for you if you wanted to take this work uh, further or if you wanted to make it more, um, if you wanted to sort of strengthen the evidence that you have and say something a little bit more meaningful? So I would say that um, now, obviously, the nature of the station sessions was very much exploratory, right? And so I would say that in a good way to proceed from now would be gathering sort of from, from what I've learned so far would be to then do a much more targeted kind of elicitation or kind of effectively come up with some sort of um you know word word and sentence list which then gives you much more control over the context because that's going to give you um for, for one thing it's going to give you a much more balanced data set um and um, then you're going to get a lot, I would imagine, a lot less kind of other types of variation in the data, which actually then enable, enable you to kind of dig down into what are actually these phonological operations. But it also might then make it easier to to to, to then get a uh, hang on. The, but in particular, I'm thinking of the, uh, the one where it's less clear, which is the regressive harmony, right? So it's my, like I say, my, my impression at the moment is that um there isn't any regressive harmony but um because of just the nature of the data i'm working with i'm not 100 percent confident in stating that and uh yeah i think that coming up with something uh more uh even more targeted with more control is the it would be the way to go to really pin down some of these um but that said there is also a lot more i think data exploration to be done, right? So I mentioned looking at, say, static generalizations, which obviously requires a lot of kind of lexical data, um, some of which obviously I know you've already collected, so it would be interesting to look at. Um, but also um, then uh, some of the contexts where I didn't have great coverage. So I'm thinking in particular, not only the, the between the regressive harmony or potential regressive harmony between prefixes and roots, but then things within words. Um, so like, uh, yeah, the example I gave in the slide was uh, mutemi and nzogu, um, where these are, seem to be stem, uh, stem or even root internal, right? And so yeah, kind of picking apart the different, uh, uh, the different and morphological environments for potential application of our harmony. Um, yeah, obviously this was a very much intensive thing, so I didn't get the nice spread of data that you would ideally want, but you know, this is part of the fun. So um I should say I jumped uh, I, I jumped right into a question. If anybody else has a uh, question, do feel free to raise your hand and uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Or uh, alternatively, you can write a, a text question in the uh, chat module of the Zoom application. Um, just uh, following on uh, immediately, Stephen, um, it struck me this asymmetry between uh, between these uh, 
these sort of, well, I don't want to, well, yeah, these indeterminate vowels, these vowels that we haven't determined. So uh, in the first, uh, the, the front one uh, had a certain characterization and uh, surprisingly the, uh, the back one had the opposite characterization. I oh, want to see if you yeah, have yeah. any, uh, any sort of uh, comment to make or further comment to make on that. Yeah, so um, this is something that I'm not sure about because of, yeah, the, mm. like I say, the kind of impressionistic nature of this. And I haven't sat down and, you know, say, obviously I've coded these only by the, the phonemic categories that I know exist. So coding then my impression of the precise quality of each of these would require me to sit down and then you know, say hand code, like, well, you know, to this token, say, is um, laxa sounds to be on the tense side rather than the lax side, say. Um, but obviously, that's not ideal. And if we can get some kind of more empirically grounded measure of this, then that would be fantastic. So I think one way to go would be explore these measures um, I've got on this slide here in uh, Stalwart's thesis. Um, using, for example, center of gravity, um, and then uh, other measures and measures derived from um, the first and uh, second form and to to the potential correlates for um, tongue root advancement or retraction, um, and then pot potentially also just to get a better handle on the vowel space, like I say, use say something like PCA, which is able to handle multi-dimensional data. Um, to kind of get a nice char yeah characterization of the of the of the vowel space yeah so I would say that yeah both kind of a more considered reflection of my impressions but also trying in so far as it's possible with acoustic data to ground that in and some sort of empirical reality not to say not to mention um you know the potential for uh, articulate work which obviously comes with a whole host of other challenges, right? In this context, especially. I uh, I appreciate sort of sort of getting your thoughts on yeah on on, on procedurally how, what what this would mean and what we would need to do to sort of learn a little bit more about it. I I, I appreciate that. Stanislav, you have your hand up. Please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the solution to my everlasting headache when I think about Isanzo. Yeah, these two sound, these two vowels are uh, always torturing me. <laughs> Thanks to Andrew, I adopted this um, orthography, those two letters, but still the acoustic and, uh, you know, the intrasystemic function of these vowels are not clear to me. So uh, thanks to your presentation, I developed a deeper understanding of the nature of these two sounds, but I was thinking about also about historical explanations. You know, the super high vowels have fixed place within um, different kinds of within different parts of speech so it's predictable where you can find them and when i was transcribing my isanzu data so i i always came back to the historical reconstruction to this proto proto bantu models just to determine whether i have to put e or this e, something like i cannot pronounce properly uh, I think that might be another source of um, methodology, I would say, um, just to make this tri triangulation. So you have phonetics, you have acoustics, you have historical look at this data, then maybe you will find out what are these mysterious vowels. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'll definitely take that comment on board, and I'm very glad to hear that yeah, I'm thrilled to hear that you uh, uh, that my presentation went uh, yeah went over well with you. So yeah, um, but I think yeah, it's uh, it, it could also perhaps then speak to the way in which the language has developed over time, right? So if we from evidence uh, from the Bantu languages as a whole, we reconstruct certain qualities for particular in particular positions at the proto stage, then. It may be that there have been particular developments in Yihanzu as well, right? Um, and I'm at the moment, I'm largely ignorant of what what those are. So that's yeah, also a very, I think, a potentially fruitful avenue for for future work. Yeah. 
And I should uh, I should say that I I won't take credit for the bard vowel convention. That's uh, <laughs> that's something that I stole from Oliver Stegen's work on uh, on Rangi. Uh, I thought it was useful for what uh, for what I was doing. So we can thank uh, we can thank Oliver for that. Uh, but very useful, I agree, uh, Stanislav. Um, I see that we don't have any uh, further uh, hands raised and we don't have any uh, uh, text questions in the chat. But uh, with that said, I don't think that there remains anything other than to uh, thank our speaker for their very detailed and methodal and, uh, and methodical um, uh, analysis of the data. So thank you very much, uh, thank you. Stephen.